Good evening and welcome to Resia again on this uh, old night. Thank you for coming. Um, I'm very uh, happy to have uh, Dr. Richard Piran McClary with me uh, talking uh, from uh, York. And Richard is a senior lecturer uh, in Islamic art and architecture at the University of York. And he received his doctorate from the University of Edinburgh in 2015. He has lectured extensively on a range of uh, subjects related to medieval Islamic art and architecture around the world. And also he is very well known to Russia audiences uh, because he has already given a seminar for us in 2018. Uh, in which he was discussing the work in progress of what then uh, has become an article uh, which is in press at the moment, and it's about the um, um, minaret scape of, uh, of Anatolia and Turkey. Um, Richard has uh, held the Liverhulme Trust Early Career Fellowship at the University of Edinburgh from 2015 and 2018. Uh, examining the surviving corpus of Karahanid architecture in Central Asia. And he is a very prolific writer. His first monograph entitled Rum Seljuk Architecture 1170 to 1220, The Patronage of Sultans, was published by University uh, Edinburgh University Press in 2017. And his second monograph, uh, Medieval Monuments of Central Asia, Karahanid architecture of the 11th and 12th centuries, also with the EUP, um, was published recently in 2020. Um, Richard has also uh, recently uh, published a, an article on geometric interlace, a study of the rise, fall, and meaning of stereotomic strap work in the architecture of, of Rum Seljuk Anatolia in Anatolian Studies 2022, which obviously contributes to the current wider debate on ornament in Islamic art. And uh, uh, today, Richard will talk to us on a new exciting uh, work in progress that will be published in the Journal of Material Culture of the Muslim World. Um, and the title of this uh, seminar is Rare and complex wares, a study of vessels and shirts decorated with both Mina E and Lasta techniques. I remind the audience to write their comments or, or questions in the chat, and I will read them aloud at the end of the seminar. Thank you very much, Richard, for being with us uh, tonight, and um, over to you. Oh, lovely. Well, thank you so much for that, and thank you everyone for joining. Um, I'm aware my mic isn't of the highest quality, so um, I will try and shout it a bit louder, but um, do let me know if you can't hear properly. Um, so today I'm going to introduce a little known corpus, a very distinctive type of wares combining two overglaved techniques and present a few previously unpublished examples um, alongside some better known pieces. And I'm going to do my usual attempt to try and make bits of broken pots interesting, uh, but you will have to be the judges of whether I'm successful in that mission or not. Uh, before I start, I just want to introduce three of the styles of Minai that I've uh, identified and which are pertinent to today's discussion. A brief summary was published in Mukarnas a couple of years ago, and the full study will be included in my forthcoming monograph on Minai, currently in press and due out at some point in the middle of next year. Uh, on the top left, you have style one, which is the most common, always on white, and usually featuring a blue Kufic inscription band on the rim, and light green details outlined in black. Style two on the right has rather more sparse decoration, figural and roomy motifs, and a blue band with the inscription left in white reserved. The third, style seven, features gold Kufic outlined in red, often but not always on a blue band, and an additional decorative element in gold with red outline in many cases as well. So with that out of the way, I will start to address the main topic of today's talk. The two most prestigious and technically challenging ceramic decorative techniques used in the Islamic world in the 12th and 13th centuries 
were arguably Minai and Luster. Minai, also called Haftrang or Seven Colors, was in use in Iran and seemingly primarily in the region of Kashan in central Iran in the latter part of the 12th and the first few decades of the 13th century. It consists of a mix of inglaze and overglaze applications of enamel pigments made of ground glass with metal oxides providing the color. The result is brightly colored miniature decoration that is largely figural with a level of detail and polychromy not seen in other types of medieval ceramic wares. Luster is a process that creates a metallic sheen on the surface of the vessel, which can be either painted detail or cover large areas and have the pattern scratched in to reveal the white glaze beneath. And this latter approach allowed for finer detail than was generally possible with painted luster. By far the rarest type of medieval Iranian fine glazed ceramic wares are the pieces that feature both of these types of overglazed decoration on the same vessel. I've categorized the pieces that combine both techniques as style nine in my new taxonomic framework. The rationale for medieval potters in Iran having attempted to produce such wares is clear. The successful combination of the bright, crisp colors and miniature detail possible with Minai and the flashing, reflective metallic sheen of luster would have resulted in a dazzling tour de force of the potter's art on a single vessel or tile. The reason that so few fragments survive lie in the extreme technical challenges created in the attempt to combine these two different techniques. Each one alone is fraught with risk, and many pieces of Minai ware have overfired colors which turn blotchy or run. There's an inherent kill risk of parts of the kiln being hotter than others, causing the luster to adhere to the glaze in an irregular manner. In addition, having a different color inside than outside is common with the luster of style nine wares, and it's difficult to match the temperature requirements for these two techniques. It was clearly an extremely challenging combination to execute successfully, and if the temperature in the reducing kiln was not hot enough, the luster would not bond to the glaze. The problems of authenticity with most seemingly complete Minai ware vessels are well documented, and for that reason, sherds and bowl bases are studied alongside some seemingly complete, but generally restored pieces. While incomplete, sherds have generally not been altered, although there are the odd exceptions, and are much more reliable as evidence for establishing both the nature of the production process and the main design principles. This study of the corpus of wares that combine both techniques has identified two main variants. Style 9A is the more detailed one, generally the combination of painted and scratched luster, refined and large scale overglazed painted figural decoration, usually on cavetto bowls. And 9B is more commonly seen on carinated or angular sided bowls, featuring smaller and more crudely executed figures and a far less refined method of applying the luster with a muddy appearance and no scratch designs. And the two types may have been produced for different sectors of the market, with one most likely having been more expensive than the other. And they all appear to be on a white glaze. So although a lot of Minai ware is on turquoise, uh, all of these style nine wares are on a white base glaze. Very little has been written specifically on this group of wares that feature both techniques. Arthur Upham Pope addressed two examples briefly in his and uh, Phyllis Ackerman's A Survey of Persian Art, focusing primarily on a partial tile in Boston that we'll see shortly, and this bowl signed by Al Mukri that was then in the possession of Franklin Mott Gunther, but uh, is now unknown for its location. And it was not until Oliver Watson's landmark book on Persian lusterware that additional examples were addressed specifically with regard to the combination of the two techniques. The small corpus of 22 pieces spread across several major collections of Islamic art around the world consists of a mix of fragments and repaired vessels. The luster decoration on these wares appears to be subordinate to the Minai and was mainly used for its surface effect with the minai used for the intricate miniature polychrome detail. And the luster tends to dominate the exterior. Well, again, with all these medieval things, there's more exceptions than rules. Um, and the, the interior is generally the focus of the two different techniques. In the majority of pieces of this style 9A, the luster's con combined with a distinctive cursive Nask script in light green delineated in black, in addition, several elements associated with the style one that we saw earlier, including inglaze blue arabesque patterns, blue kufic, and the associated light green elements delineated with overglazed black can be seen. 
there are four of these bowls. Uh, this is one of them in the Sarakani collection. Uh, the other is in the Gunther collection and the one in the Louvre we'll see as well. Uh, there's a luster painted bird inside the foot of this. Um, and similar luster painted uh, birds are seen in the foot of several other vessels as well of this type. The luster can be seen to have been applied both as a layer over the surface into which patterns were scratched, as well as um, being carefully applied to apply the general, uh, generally vegetal pattern um, with the background being white. And you can see that uh, better on the exterior here. There are only two examples of Stein nine wares with any figural luster decoration. And this is definitely not one of them, uh, apart from the small bird. While virtually no luster remains on the interior, there are large areas on the outside. And it is uh, it has had extensive restoration, as you can see if you look at the upper image of the inscription band. But uh, the significant portion of it is original, and it uh, has an exceptionally well-drawn horse and rider. The blue inglaze has overfired slightly on the inside, and um, the dark brown luster painted bird is the one we can just see here on the left. And the text uh, that's been translated by Oliver Watson is just given up there. It's a cursive inscription, it's a Persian quatrain and an Arabic uh, couplet added on, and the artist's signature. The luster in the background of the inscription is painted. And unlike some of the other examples, there's no luster, uh, there's no white reserve around the letters. And, and that'll, you'll see what I mean when we come to that shortly. But it's very similar. Both these uh, Mukwi bowls are very similar in technique. If we look at them uh, next to each other, this is the other one, the one that Pope published in 1936. And assuming that at least some of the color on the body of the horse and the clothes of the rider is original, uh, which is often a risky assumption, to be fair. Um, the bowl does appear to be in a slightly more finished state than the Sarakhani piece. Unfortunately, it's impossible to determine just how much, if any, luster survived on the outside uh, due to the low resolution of this 1936 image uh, that Pope supplied. A very significant style 9A bowl base and rim section currently embedded within the matrix of plaster fill and modern fired sherds to form a seemingly complete vessel is this one here in the Louvre in Paris. It's 67 millimeters high and was originally about 220 millimeters wide, purchased from Jean Soustiel in 1970. There are approximately 13 original sherds glued back together and the newly fired sections have glaze on the top that is rounded at the edges rather than broken as is found on true original shirts. They're not crazed in the same way and the luster has a different range of colors. This image shows the original shirts with the modern material digitally removed as if by magic for clarity. Alongside the main central horse and rider in Minoi, the cursive cavetto and rim uh, inscription bands, there are multiple surviving areas of luster decoration and a variety of different tones. And unlike the majority of examples, the bowl in its original state had a wide flat rim of the same plane as the base with a very shallow cavetta. So it's, it's close almost to a, a plate really than a bowl. The outside section of the flat rim has ruby red luster flashing on the narrow band above the inscription and darker red luster on the small lobes on the edge itself. This is on the left hand image. And below these are intricate areas of scratched and painted luster infill. The blue glaze colorant has bled out due to overfiring on the inscription of the rim and the textile of the rider with the blue fabric in slight relief. The blue inscription band has a matte finish, but there are some traces of gold that appear to have burned, and these remain within the original confines of the letter forms, with the blue presumably having spread out during one of the kiln firings. The surviving portion of the cursive Persian inscription band in the cavetto of the bowl in light green with a thin black outline is delineated in the same manner as that on several other sherds of nine, uh, style 9A wares and partial bowls. And this use of this uh, light green with a black outline is one of the general characteristics um, commonly seen on style one and on a significant number, but by no means all of the style 9A wares that have been identified. And unfortunately, the Persian inscription has uh, still eluded any meaningful translation. The main decoration, I think we can just go back and have a look at it, uh, features a figure on horseback, and the horse is extremely well delineated, as is the case with several of the other bowls in this group. The only decoration on the exterior was in luster, 
with no evidence of Minai, and it's not entirely clear what the nature of that decoration was. It may well have never bonded particularly well, but it certainly isn't clear to see now. Despite the fragmentary nature of the piece, it's clear this was an unusually shaped vessel. And despite the loss of control of the blue, the piece was considered valuable enough to add luster decoration in a variety of different compositions in order to give a multiplicity of color tones. And this significance was also recognized in the modern era when a great deal of effort was put into creating newly fired sections to complete the appearance of the vessel. Now, while the majority of the corpus is now outside of Iran, there is a shirt in the National Museum of Iran in Tehran for the section of a standard Star One inscription band with a portion of the green leaf with black outlines. But in addition, there is finely executed luster decoration. This is uh, on the left here, the, both sides of the, the, the shirt. Uh, it has a redder outline and then a more golden color used to fill in the delineated areas. The quality of the luster and the crispness of the minai show that the original piece was very successfully fired. And here on the right, you can see again the cursive green inscription with a black outline, as is seen on the mukri bowls. However, while fragmentary, the luster on the shirt is much better preserved than on any of the bowls. And the exterior features blue lines and an area of turquoise with fine black outlines in the manner of style one. The shirt is a piece of a bowl that successfully combined the two techniques on both the interior and exterior, making it a particularly important piece. A small area of white background is left around each group of the connected cursive letters, and then dense luster decoration is painted in the remaining space. Another couple of shirts in Tehran a small fragment, similar inscription, but definitely from a different, uh, different vessel, as it lacks the reserve left around the letter. So you can see there's clearly a degree of diversity across the corpus, small though it is. And there appears to have been what looks like a Kufic inscription in luster, uh, if that's just the image on the left there, um, just above the little fragment of the, uh, the green Nash fragment. So, I mean, we're dealing with very, very small pieces here. I mean, you can see from the size that they're about two centimeters uh, square on the one hand and then two by just over one centimeter square on the other. Uh, but uh, when, when you're dealing with something this uncommon, one has to take whatever one can find. Now, these three shirts in Tehran taken together retain a far greater amount of luster than the majority of seemingly complete bowls. And there's no evidence of loss of control of the inglazed blue that is visible on other shirts that we'll see. And these all show that the combination of the two technically challenging surface treatments was perhaps more successfully executed than the corpus of restored bowls with faint, partial, or mostly missing luster and blotchy inglazed blue might suggest. And the better state of preservation also allows for some observations concerning the process of production it can be seen that the black overglazed lines were added over the top of the luster and were fixed in the final firing of the vessel. Given the need to fire the base glaze, then the luster, it is clear that these pieces had to be fired at least three times. Another shirt, this time in the Museum for Islamic Kunst in Berlin, is from the rim of a bowl and also features the light green decoration with black delineation on the inside here on the right. On the interior, you see the standard Star One inscription band, but with luster instead of the green. And the exterior has a green bird in black with a much glossier finish. The, uh, the surface is much better preserved on the exterior than the interior for whatever reason. And the luster also covers the rim. As you can see here, you've got this scratched decoration with the bird added. There's this particularly impressive style 9A bowl base in Kuwait in the Al Saba collection with extensive surviving luster and a Nasc inscription. The cursive green with black outline consists of a Persian quatrain and it reads, the nightingale of my heart is lost in the rose garden of your face. The compass of the constellation broke because of your face. I survived, but you did not bother to hunt my heart. But you hunt hearts by just a glimpse of your face. Blessing. Uh, there are a couple of varied readings, but that gives the sense of the tone of what we're talking about on these bowls. Only the bottom sections of the caveto survive, but enough remains to see that the interior features a series of nine blue outlined roundels, each containing a combination of inglazed blue and thin lines of luster decoration. Whereas in contrast, the exterior has large areas of much darker luster and traces of roundels in blue. 
There are two colors of luster used in the interior, a browner one for much of the decoration and a redder one applied much more finely around the cursive light green inscription in the form of fine vegetal tendrils. The bold base features five different luster techniques in total. Uh, there are two in combination, namely the fine tendrils with red luster and then the golden brown luster painted around them as background. The same light brown is painted in four sections and in the form of split palmettes. Also on the underside, there's the dark brown uh, luster bowl, uh, luster bird, and finally uh, an inscription scratched in, which has uh, some uh, flashing. Unlike the Sarakani and Al Mukri, the uh, Sarakani Al Mukri bowl in Paris, and even the Tehran one, the Kuwait bowl base here has a line in a different mix of luster painted in to create the white reserve around each word. So again, you see each time you look at some of these pieces, you see slightly different techniques being used. There's, there's no uniformity. Some of the types of decoration that are applied in luster on style 9A wares can also be found on vessels that are entirely luster decorated. And one example is this fragmentary and unrestored bowl section uh, currently in Los Angeles. It has the same sort of vegetal designs, birds and scratch decoration as we see on style 9A wares. It demonstrates the shared vocabulary of ornament, but the crispness of detail that is possible when only luster is being applied and no additional overgaze firing is required highlights the problems that the potters sometimes experience when trying to combine these two very different techniques on the same vessel. If we look at this shirt in, uh, in the Freer in Washington, it has a number of details suggested that it was also part of what would be plaster style 9A bowl. It has scratched luster, and a wide color palette. And the, the layer of luster applied around the Minai bird is thinner than on the other panel of the luster on the left. While the form is a little lighter, it seems that it have been may, may have been too much applied on the left side as it has spread out and caused this light pink staining of the white sections revealed by the process of scratching the luster layer prior to firing. And this is an example of something called red flashing caused by the copper becoming slightly volatile and staining the glaze around the design. Now, in addition to the blue in glaze colorant used for the lines for the basic design, there's a significant number of colors used on this one small shirt. You see there's gray for the head, black for the outline, along with brown for the beak and other parts of the neck, then pink for the main body, red for the feet, and finally green accents on the body and the wingtip. And this is a far greater range of colors than seen on most pieces of Minoi wear and is indicative of this shirt having been part of a very high quality piece. Now, if we turn to this de-restored fragmentary Coveto bowl in the National Museum of Iran in Tehran, it appears at first glance to be a style one bowl, albeit lacking uh, the red that one might expect to see. However, on close examination, there are very faint traces of scratched luster decoration, and that's what we see just vaguely uh, here in this area, if you can see the cursor. Uh, in the background of part of the inscription band. And although invisible, only visible on a small area, it's enough evidence to suggest that this also might be considered an example of a style 9A bowl. And the, the way the figures are delineated is very similar. And it's of particular importance as it bears a date. So if indeed it is an example of style 9A, it is the only piece of style 9A, uh, style 9 ware that is dated, it's dated Shawal 604, which is April 1208. Now, while much of the material I'm presenting here has been written up and, and will be published soon, uh, last month I was in Tokyo on a research trip and uh, much to my delight, I got very excited when I came across this at the, uh, in looking through stuff in the Idemitsu collection in Tokyo. It has extensive, uh, and I mean, I mean even by the standards of Minai, extensive fill and overpaint, but like the Louvre and Tehran bowls, it does retain luster on the lower exterior as well as on some of the sherds inserted into the rim. These traces of luster have been noted once in a recent publication in Japanese, but not to my knowledge in, in any publications outside of Japan. Um, so I'm hoping to be able to uh, do a more detailed study of this piece. Now, if we look on the inside, the bleeding of the blue has occurred as is quite uh, standard and traces of uh, a luster design can be seen. And I've just highlighted here, there's uh, an inscription band painted lightly uh, in luster, and there's also the scratched uh, decoration behind the inscription band, the blue inscription band above it. 
Alongside the, uh, the Style 9 pieces that share characteristics with the Style 1, there are three more pieces that don't have those characteristics, but still seem to fit into this broad category uh, that I've uh, put together. And one of the most impressive and well-preserved is in the Musée des Beaux-Arts in Lyon, is a cavetto, cavetto bowl on a high foot with a central horse and rider in the middle, albeit a little smaller than the ones on the two Mukri bowls and the one in the Louvre. And it has a blue Kufic inscription bound around the rim and very well executed, very highly detailed luster decoration. It has been repaired, but uh, as you can see where those repairs are, they haven't overpainted the areas that were missing. But the majority of the decoration appears to be original. And the luster roundels alternate with simple uh, roomy or arabesque patterns in the cavetto. And there are also eight inverted triangles, each with a small pendant based at the base of the inscription band, which you can see here on the left. This is on the inside. And these roundels are unique in the corpus of style 9A wares, but then when it's such a small corpus, almost everything's unique, to be fair. So I don't want to read too much into that. But they have stippling on the clothing and are surrounded by simple arabesque patterns. And unlike the majority of style 9A wares, this bowl doesn't have any of the scratched, swirling lines through the luster, indicative of Watson's Kashan style and attributed to after 1200. There are a number of luster sweetmeat dishes, including this one in the Harvard Art Museum, that have very similar seated figures with stippled dress, surrounded by split palmettes set in roundels. It also has similar, if slightly simpler, triangle shapes with a circle at the lower tip, as can also be seen in the bowl in Lyon. The presence of figures and the lack of the incised luster decoration seen on the majority of, a, of other style 9A wares demonstrates the difficulty in piecing together a clear picture of the scope and diversity of joint Minai and luster decorated wares from such a small, small corpus of shirts and repaired bowls. Now, here we've got the only tile in the corpus of Style 9 is in the Museum of Fine Art in Boston. This was, uh, uh, along with the, the now lost Al Mukri Bowl, was one of the earliest pieces of Style 9A where to be published. It was uh, published by Pope. Uh, just over half of the tile survives with three and a half of the original eight points intact. And there are numerous pieces of Minai ware with an identifiable scene from the Shahnameh, the Persian Book of Kings by Ferdowsi. But this is the only example that also has a cursive inscription that describes what is being depicted. The text reads, Raftani Irani as Desi Farud, or the Iranians leaving Farud's fortress. The surface of the tile is packed with figures, and there's not a lot of background, but where there is, with the exception of the cursive inscription, is covered with very finely painted and scratched luster. The beards of the two main figures are depicted in a very distinctive and sophisticated manner, and the luster decoration is also very well executed and successfully fired. It's long been assumed that both Minai and luster wear were luxurious wares that would make the examples that combine both techniques especially desirable. And while not as luxurious as textiles or precious metals, the multiple firings, and in some case the use of gold, does indicate that style 9A Minai wares were something of a luxury. However, the level of luxury that such wares represent remains unclear. There were clearly examples being produced at two levels of quality, as the style 9B wares that will come to soon are more quotidian in nature. And in relation to luxury ceramics more broadly, Watson notes that such wares are fragile with no intrinsic value and made with relatively cheap raw materials. They were essentially worthless when broken, yet still large numbers were sold and traded in the late 12th and early 13th centuries. And their existence is indicative of a large body of customers with the surplus cash to acquire such non-essential items. They would say a single vessel might not be particularly expensive and I don't think should be uh, attributed to being courtly. Uh, but if you're gonna cover a wall with large number of these sort of tiles, that does suggest a, a whole other level of, uh, of wealth and uh, prosperity. Um, another piece of style nine, we'll come through these fairly quickly, that has sophisticated luster, both painted and scratched, is this jug in the freer. Uh, it's got an illegible inscription due to the extensive restoration. Um, comparable pal palette to some style one, but uh, as with almost all seemingly complete uh, pieces of midnight wear, this is a problematic object that really needs x-rayed and, and possibly taken apart to really clearly establish what aspects are original and what date to the modern era. 
an unusual and very well executed uh, bold base in the Kia collection that we see here. No link at all to what are called style one, um, but uh, has considerable amounts of gold and red outline in the manner of some of the style seven wares that I showed a, what one example of, um, and particular these uh, this sort of frond designs in gold with uh, red outline. And alongside a uh, small shirt in the Louvre discussed below, um, this is uh, one of the only ones that has uh, elements of style seven. But with such a small corpus, it's impossible to determine the true scope of the production of style nine wares. But as the examples discussed here show, while general trends can be observed, the level of diversity within such a small corpus suggests that a great deal of information remains buried in the ground and a fuller picture will only emerge slowly over time as more material is excavated and published. And may indeed involve some uh, the archaeology of archives and seeing the stuff that may well have been excavated but is just sitting in boxes in the basement of museums. The hand on the figure to the right of the central tree is a replacement, but the faint luster decoration, which is both painted and scratched all over the white background areas, appears to be unaltered. While the interior of the bowl has extensive overglazed decoration, the exterior is far less decorative. And you can see that here, it's just fairly uh, plain decoration. Uh, very similar indeed to a large and recently conserved luster bowl in the Ashmolean. Most of the uh, surface features overglazed Minai decoration on the inside, but we do have this finely scratched decoration. There's also this small shirt in the Louvre that has a, another example of style seven, this time not on a blue band, but it has the same square angular kufic in gold with the white uh, background and the red outline. Although it's very small, this does indeed give us a great deal of information about the production process. There are three small dots of blue inglaze colorant on the left, you can see them, and the red lines have been applied after the luster was fired. The areas of gold are then applied over the red, which has bled into some areas, um, and the luster is well fired. And this is, along with the one in the Kia, the only uh, style seven type decoration. Again, no trace of Minai on the outside, but given the size of it, that's uh, not definitive, but it does seem like it's a generally all over uh, luster design. Has molded hexagons, each outlined in brown luster. And although only parts of two hexagons survive, they have a different painted pattern inside each one. There's also no evidence of any uh, scratched luster, uh, can, as far as we can see. There are clear links between the decoration on some examples of luster wear with figural decoration, and that found on numerous pieces of Minoi wear, as this miniature style luster bowl base shows. You have the same sort of figures, horses, branch with dot motif, and even Kufic inscription bands with the lettering in reserve. This is quite an unusual example of that as seen on style two Minai wares. Such similarities suggest that at least some of the time, the same painters were working with both luster and Minai. However, in the case where both techniques were used on the same vessel, the luster is generally used solely as background decoration with the polychrome overglazed pigments used for the main decoration. Now, don't worry, this next bit isn't anything like as long as the first. We're nearly done. The main defining characteristic of the second group, style B, are smaller scale, more crudely executed figures um, alongside the style one motifs who have thicker, less decorative, and seemingly more poorly fired luster decoration. The small, rapidly painted Minai figures and single lines of luster seem to be applied with a fairly wide brush. It's used primarily as a surface effect. It's not the refined or detailed decoration and was implied in a similar width and level of detail as the enclosing lines of inglaze blue. There are three known, three known examples of bowl bases of this type. Uh, there's luster applied in the areas around the figures. Uh, this one here in Q8 that we see, uh, another one in Paris. And there are two seemingly complete bowls that have very similar decoration as well. And all four pieces, as with most of the 9A, are broadly sharing characteristics with the most common Minai style. The Sarakani collection has uh, this bowl here. Uh, it's on a large, tall, straight foot ring. And while it has been extensively reconstructed with areas of plaster fill on the rim, uh, and you can see much of the original areas, the luster has either burned off or never fully adhered, 
but enough retain, remains to determine that it is fairly crude with none of the delicacy and quality of execution seen in the earlier words, or earlier today, not earlier production. Sequencing is not something we have any data for. Um, this general trend uh, can be seen across the wider corpus with more luxurious and well-executed large-scale figural decoration generally being on the cavetto or the curved walls and then the, the somewhat less sophisticated on the ones with the, the angular sides uh, as you see here. Luster replaces the green with black outline and red dots seen in the style one inscription bands with the same basic uh, blue, uh, blue text. And none of the surviving examples of this second less sophisticated group feature scratched inscriptions or uh, scratch decorations. So this uh, base similar style, this is in the Louvre. You can see two views of the, the side of the base and then the actual decoration from above. Um, Single horse and rider, again, fairly standard uh, sort of uh, iconography, uh, yet to be interpreted meaningfully, although many have tried. Um, but the difference in scale and quality demonstrates the wide range of types of wares that were being produced using the same technical processes. We have this one that we just saw, that's the one in Q8, um, three figures in roundels. Um, blue has very seriously degraded, probably in burials, so although it looks gray, it probably did look a lot more blue when it was produced. And this is the only seemingly, uh, one of the, uh, the only other seemingly complete bowl uh, in the Aga Khan Museum in Toronto. Uh, very extensive amounts of restoration, but again, despite the areas of fill and overpaint, it does consist of a lot of uh, genuine fragments put back together. Follows the same sort of pattern. Uh, the Kufic inscription band is unusually lower and turquoise, uh, you know, rather than at the top of the rim, it's at the base of the bowl, but still fits into the same broad pattern. Um, number of different ways of depicting faces, um, but uh, slightly more sophisticated use of luster, but as you can see, it's certainly not on the level of something like the one that's in the Kia collection with the very fine detailed scratching and, and infilling. And if we uh, take a look at the, uh, back of it, uh, or the outside rather, again, you can see the uh, the section, use my mouse, uh, this section here is all, all plaster filled with modern overpaint, but if we focus on the bit more on the left, you can see a very finely applied uh, red design and then a more brown uh, pigment used to create the, the decoration itself. Um, and here you can see there's a mix of order. It does look like the, the red goes over the top of the brown. So the sequencing isn't totally clear. Um, it needs closer study. I did go and look at it uh, earlier this year, but um, one can always uh, look more closely at these things. They have many secrets to be revealed. But it's certainly a two-stage process. Uh, coming to the end, there's uh, an additional bold base in the freer, uh, haven't been able to see this one and it isn't the best photograph, so apologies. And it does look like it might actually have a small scratched area. So as soon as we come up with a rule, we can usually find uh, something that breaks that rule, but nevertheless, general trends can be observed. And uh, finally, in terms of the style B, uh, we have this piece in the Louvre, a uh, small piece that uh, has uh, a little um, armband, a tiraz band, but here it's uh, painted in luster rather than being done in gold leaf, which is the more common uh, approach. And this is, it sort of fits in between. You could, could put this in either category, but the sketchy design, uh, the smaller figure, and the, the sort of more yellow tone to the luster suggests it should probably, if it has to be classed as one or the other, be, be in the 9B category. Uh, but again, these, these are not fixed, rigid rules. It's just a starting point to try and understand this corpus of material. Uh, one last piece we're going to look at uh, is these pieces that might look to initially to be examples of style nine uh, wear, but are in fact um, modern confections produced for the commercial market. Uh, this one here in the Walters Art Museum uh, has style two decoration. This particular band here is very, uh, very common. And if we look closely, there isn't actually a single point where the area with the luster actually interacts with the sections with Minai. Uh, this is uh, mostly overpaint over here, but you can also see the level of crazing that is seen on the Minai section isn't replicated on the luster section. There's no crazing on that. So what we have is the upper part of a different vessel put onto something uh, 
that didn't maybe have an upper section or had lost it uh, or was too damaged in order to create something more uh, appealing. And indeed, Walters, Henry Walters was warned that many such pieces in the market uh, by Dikran Kalekian uh, were very questionable. Uh, he'd written to Dikran Kalekian going, oh, I can get so many good pieces cheap. And he said, no, no, you can't. Um, you're buying duds. Uh, and subsequently, a lot of the Walters Minai has been shown to, to be very problematic with questionable levels of authenticity. Um, we see these clear break lines between the two sections. Um, so an interesting piece it has a story to tell, but not one that we should include in this category. So despite the small corpus of only 22 pieces, there's enough evidence to show there's a wide variety of types being produced, especially of the more refined style A, 9A. And this degree of diversity in the small corpus demonstrates the innovation and lack of standardization on the part of the artisans in the still barely understood production context of these wares. What seems likely is that at least some of these pieces would have been fired at least three times, rather than the presumed two firings that are, are indicated by Abel Carson. And the complex and unique nature of this material poses questions about the production process. While evidence is lacking, the fact that the great majority features style one decoration alongside luster suggests that for a brief period, one possibly dominant production facility combined these two most challenging of overglazing techniques successfully. And while these two broad styles can be determined, there's a great degree of diversity within them, especially in the case of the former. And despite the small size of the corpus, their existence is testament to the culture of collaboration, experimentation and innovation on the part of the artisans responsible for their production, working at a range of registers of quality. Despite the clear technical problems inherent in combining the two techniques, there were numerous pieces produced in a variety of different ways. The skilled artisans continued to attempt to marry together the intricate polychrome decoration of overglazed decoration and the metal oxides that shine like the sun on the same glazed stone paste surface. Thank you. Thank you very much, Richard. <laughs> Thank you very much for this very interesting insight into these complex pieces and for bringing them uh, together. Not an easy task, given that uh, they are scattered around so many <laughs> so many collections around the world yes yes yes, yeah. <laughs> yes um so audience please write your comments and questions in the chat in the meanwhile um i wanted to ask you i mean uh, uh, i was i mean you uh, you talked about it towards the end about the complexity of the techniques uh used and you talked about different uh, firings so we know you know the technical challenges of luster paint and those of minai so to what extent has the technical aspects of combining the two have been studied i mean has it been reconstructed have have potters you know contemporary potters tried to to make such wear um you know, in the same way that uh, uh, last uh, where has been made also in modern times, or for example, the reconstruction of uh, enameling and gilding on glass has been done in modern times. So I just um, wanted to know whether you know something. Um, in terms of has anyone made recently uh, something that combines the two? Not that I know of. Abbas Akbari would be the best person to speak to about that. Um, I haven't had a chance to see him recently. I, I talked to him uh, earlier this year, but um, I haven't asked him about that. Um, but it'd be interesting to, to get his insight, but not that I know of. Um, in terms of the study of them, um, there, there's an ongoing project that Oliver Watson's doing with the Sarakani collection, uh, but beyond the big book that he, he published, I think maybe two, a year or two now, um, a recent article with some testing of them. But I don't think off the top of my head, I don't think one of the Luster and Minai ones were included in that, but I think eventually they will. I think there is a plan to test all of those and, and try and understand what's going on with them. Um, I don't know how much that will reveal other than, yes, it's Luster and yes, it's you know, <laughs> Minai combined. Um, but I think it'd be interesting to see what does come from that and, and also to, to see the x-rays to see you know just how much it is later. Uh, but in terms of how challenging it is and how to do it, it would be good to see someone try and do it. And I know there are people other than Abbas Akbari, but he's the one I know of who, who is doing the, 
certainly the best quality, you know, authentic reproductions of, of sort of Ilkhanid and, and late Seljuk or post Seljuk um, ceramics with, with overglaze, and we're certainly with luster. Thank you very much. Um, any question in the chat? Mm, not yet. So maybe I'll, uh, I'll ask another question. Uh, another question that came to mind to me, it was, it's more of a perhaps a methodological questions. I mean, you, you group this, this material into groups, which obviously facilitate the, the study in a way. But I'm wondering whether these are very helpful categories, whether there is overlap, whether you find it that they actually don't quite help. Um, well, they're, yeah, they're, they're a first step. Uh, they're certainly not the end, the end result. They're the, the means to try and make sense of a, an otherwise completely undifferentiated amorphous mass of generally Minai wares. Um, so it, by, by creating, albeit certainly uh, arbitrary on one level categories, um, it, as long as one maintains that awareness that it's a means to an end of better understanding and not an end in itself, um, I found it has been useful because just by identifying what the most common styles are, what's done the most, what is used only on white, which ones you do sometimes see on white and turquoise, um, being able to see that with these ones that combine luster, they're generally using characteristics that are seen in one of the most common styles that is only used on whiteware. So it creates a way to start working through the material, uh, but no, I, I certainly don't think it's it's you know the the end uh, the end of the road or you know the, certainly that you know right now we understand Minai. It's just in the absence of anything, I I, I felt I needed to create something. It is uh, methodologically, it's essentially a nineteenth century approach. I mean, it's it's the least contemporary approach you could find, but um, that's only because most other categorizations were done in the nineteenth century. So you know, it's, it's it, nobody judges that. It's just you use them and refine them and and, and work on it and improve it um, and move beyond that. But um, yeah, I thought I, I couldn't think of a better way to get mm. a way to make sense of, of what is a vast corpus. I mean, there's there's hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of vessels of varying degrees of quality and authenticity, um, and thousands and thousands of shirts. I'm just in the process of cataloging. Uh, we've found 800, uh, a colleague I'm working in Tehran, uh, 800 Minai shirts that have never been accessioned or cataloged. So, you know, and actually it's, it's worked as a scientific way to test this categorization, this taxonomy, um, is that of those 800, there's probably only 20 or 30 that really don't fit anywhere unless they're just such tidy shirts that, you know, you, you could never identify what they were. Um, so it has been useful, but I, I wouldn't say it's the, the, the end of the road, definitely. Um, I see there was a question about the Mukri yes, poles. Thank you very much. I'm going to read it out. Sure. So Fuxia Hart says, can you talk a bit more about the Al Mukri piece, uh, pieces? Do you think they are unfinished? Thank you. Um, yeah, very good question. I don't, I don't really know. Um, I think they probably were closer to finished than we think they were, and, and not uh, the, the, the losses were through not being fired, not fired correctly, you know, that they were finished, um, and then they were fired and, and there were losses, because some of them do have overglaze, you know, the one that we still have, it has overglaze, so, you know, you wouldn't add that black fine line as a next phase if the first bit hadn't been deemed worth taking to market, so just in terms of practicality and sort of expediency it seems like what our idea of finished is, is is maybe different from what theirs was I mean we see things like some of the luster tiles luster mihrabs that are very heavily distorted and damaged and might be considered seconds but were still installed and treated as finished so you know they, they maybe weren't as critical or were just aware of, of costs so whether it was a cost basis or just a different aesthetic sense that that's good that's bad um i don't know it's a very long-winded way of saying i don't really know to be honest <laughs> they've been so heavily repaired i mean firstly we can't see um that the one the, the one that's uh, whereabouts isn't known um is so partially documented um and they're all so heavily repaired overpainted fills that it, it is very difficult but I, I don't have a clear view i'd love to know what you think the future is. <laughs> thank you very much um 
while we're waiting for more uh, questions or points, I just wanted to ask you, I mean, this is something that has been studied up to a point, but maybe there is, a, there is more to do and whether you have uh, tackled the the, you know, the, the quite nice issue of the relationship of this figurative uh, and also uh, inscriptions uh, on the ceramics uh, to the uh, to manuscript painting. No, it's definitely something I've looked at. Um, there's generally an assumption that ceramics are subservient to manuscripts, um, even though we have loads of ceramics and no manuscripts in the period, which is always slightly problematic, you know, using evidence that doesn't exist <laughs> to make a case. Um, but it does see in the specific instance of uh, it's a wider Iran in the, the early 13th century, it's quite plausible that um, the people who had been doing painting on ceramics were taken or their sort of next generation were taken and put on major sort of state mandated manuscript illustration projects. Um, there's certainly a loss of manuscripts, you know, there's records and, and texts that refer to, to there being illustrated manuscripts. So there certainly were, but there's so few surviving that I, I, I'm suspicious of, of the idea that you know, they're, they're just copying manuscripts. And they're doing very different things. Yes, it's small figures uh, on a primarily white surface, some are turquoise, but beyond that, um, there's a three dimensionality. There's no connection between text and image for the most part, even where there is text, it rarely has anything to do with the images on ceramics, whereas they're very closely tied together in, in the manuscript context, even if a lot of the earlier scholarship on manuscripts illustration didn't recognize that. Um, so there are two very different things. Uh, there are a lot of similarities, uh, but there are also a lot of differences. You never really see any, apart from ponds with fish, and I'd say a large majority of those ponds with fish are on pieces that are about as old as my great grandmother at best. Um, very questionable. Uh, I'm always suspicious when you don't see a single example of a motif in a vast shirt corpus, yet you see lots of them that appeared from nowhere in the commercial art market in the 1930s. But that point aside, you don't tend to see the ground being depicted on figural ceramics. Whereas a lot of manuscripts, you do have some indication of grasses, a ground level, a transition from ground to sky. So th there's a lot of very different things about the composition as well as the design. There are overlaps as well. Um, the the um, Book of Farriery has um, an outline painted and then a slightly different, more polished outline painted of a horse. Their outlines, the initial outlines in red rather than brown. But there's, there's a lot of similarities, but I'd say there's probably more differences than similarities. Mm. Interesting. Thank you very much. Um, Mariam Rosserowin, uh, thanks, Richard. Have you been able to tell any more about who was making the fakes in the early 20th century? Is there any documentation about this? I would love to find some of that documentation. Unfortunately, a little bit like the illicit art trade now, uh, it's, it, you know, the drug dealers don't usually keep record books, neither criminals don't keep records of their crimes. Um, you know, and and uh, there may well be commercial, uh, some of the dealers still exist as corporations and may well have records, but um, it, it's not something that people wanted to shout about if they knew they were up to no good. I, I'd certainly like to see some uh, evidence if it was. Um, there is that film, I think it was Stephen Nyman made, um, it was uh, recently, uh, who was it that talked, I can't remember her name, someone was writing about it recently, she'll kill me for forgetting her name, it'll come to me, um, Keelan Overton, yes, that's it, uh, who uh, seen a film which show, it depicts a workshop making uh, brand new Minai bowls, some of which are in um, famous collections that will not be named with a 13th century date on them uh, still. So the, the, there is that uh, showing that they were being produced in Iran, um, there's a lot of pieces that you know, they've got over the fractures and repairs. They've got the little pink export permit from Iran. So we know a certain amount of that work was definitely being done in Iran, but um, there was definitely work also being additional overpaint being done in, in Paris. Uh, but in, in, as a short answer, I don't know any specific details about who was making or who was doing the restorations. 
Um, and it is a fine line. You know, if someone's got something that's fragmentary and they want it made better and they go to a commercial restorer, um, that there's nothing questionable about that. It's only when they then try and sell it as not being restored that it's problematic. So it may be the people doing the work are quite legitimately doing what they do as stock in trade. And it's just then it's subsequently marketed as something different. Um, that doesn't really answer that, does it? Sorry. No, thank you very much. Um, I, I, I have another question about the function of this of these objects. I mean, could you, I, I, you showed uh, a, a sweet meat bowl. Um, and also, you know, I was thinking about the, the tiles, the fragmented tile in the Louvre, in the Louvre, yes? Uh, the tile is in, the, in Boston. In Boston, right. And I was wondering whether you have any idea of a possible, you know, use and where. Um, I mean, tiles, yes, there's, there's lots of evidence of, of tiles having been used in situ. Um, the sacred secular term is, is problematic, but probably more likely to be in a palace than a mosque or a tomb, but there was reuse. They were taking things from palaces and using them in tombs. So um, they certainly were used in an architectural context. Um, something like the, the, the luster sweetmeat dish seems to lend itself to have been used. There's some that have a water cavity so you can fill them up with hot water and it'll keep the food warmer. So again, they have that functional element. Um, mm -hmm. When it comes to the majority of Minaiware and, uh, and the luster and Minaiware would sort of be classed within that uh, same grouping, it's very hard to really identify what they would be used for um, because it's not, it scrapes off. You know, if you start scraping, eating food out of these things with a metal spoon, the, the design will disappear very quickly. So it is, um, it is problematic to, to understand what they are. Um, the idea that they're, they're courtly, I think, has been broadly dismissed. You know, the court has gold and silver and any ceramics they have would be Chinese imported, not, not domestic wares. Um, so they're more likely to be a way for the sort of um, urban well-off um, to, to sort of show some sort of connection to courtly pleasures and the courtly lifestyle. Um, perhaps rather flippantly, I mean, I haven't put it in my book, but uh, if you were to think of a, a modern comparison, um, you know, Granny's Best China with the, you know, the coronation mug or, you know, the King's birthday um, is, is about as close a comparison as you can get. It's a way to be identified with an elite that you're not part of, but it has the aesthetic that ties to that. So um, that might be, uh, at least a, a way in to start trying to understand what these things were and how they were used. It, it seems odd that you you would have a, a stack of 10 Minai bowls that you'd sort of So um, I, I think they were kind of as much for show as anything else, but it is a, a major problem that, that, that isn't really clearly addressed. I certainly don't have a clear answer for it. I know I talked to Yves Porter about this. He, he's sort of thought a lot about it as well. Um, and, and there's no clear evidence for, for what they were used for. But where they are relatively well preserved, there's very little evidence of where from usage. It's usually as a result of burial and destruction and, and being in a latrine for 800 years. Sure, sure. Thank you very much. Um, Mariam says, thanks. I just wondered in all the work you had been doing on collectors collecting, if anything had turned up, which shed more light on, on the on the contemporary um, production. We need to keep looking. Yes, definitely. I, I'm always praying to find something. But maybe we piece of all our various researchers together, something might emerge. Um, yes. There is interesting stuff, the, the, the stuff I found in the Gulbenkian, it didn't really say so much about faking, but it, it did give a lot of information about the, the market and the relationship between dealers and collectors, because they've got both all the material and all the archives relating to it, which is, is quite distinctive. So um, I'm going back there next month uh, in January, so I might have another dig now that I know a bit more what I'm looking for. <laughs> And uh, Rehan says, thank you very much for your wonderful presentation. Are there any significant differences between the quality of the fruitware among the works you have studied in different geographies where the pieces were made? Uh, it comes to a very good point um, that we don't really know where they were made. Um, there's, there's, again, more problems than solutions. Uh, the general assumption based on stylistic analysis is that um, 
you know, there, there's things that we know were made in Kashan, and they look very similar in terms of decoration to some of this Minai and, and the Luster ware. So there's a generally accepted assumption, which I'm certainly not got any evidence to, to reject, that the, the majority, if not indeed all of this material, was produced in and around Kashan. Um, the problem is when you go through all the material in the, the National Museum of Tehran, they've got material excavated from loads of different cities all over uh, Iran uh, because they're so widely dispersed. Uh, but they haven't got anything that's actually found in Kashan, which is sort of somewhat, it's a little bit like using the using the non-existent manuscripts as evidence for antecedent, uh, using the non-existent uh, Kashani sources to, to prove that it was all produced there. So we don't know where they were made. Um, petrographic analysis has been done on quite a lot of different sherds. Um, but again, if you don't know where they're from, that only tells you so much. It can tell you they're slightly different, but that can be that uh, one person's using river rock and another person's at the foot of a mountain and using quartz in blocks. Um, it, you know, it, it doesn't necessarily tell you unless they're actual wasters stuck together in a kiln context that have been excavated at a specific site. It, it can only tell you so much. Um, there is definitely a lot more work that needs to be done. I mean, we're only just starting, but given the fact that I'm doing essentially a 19th century methodology shows how far behind the field is um, compared to other areas. Uh, but there are people uh, like Mujan Matin who are sort of doing material science work um, to, to look at it from that perspective. So there is uh, work being done both in Iran and, and more broadly. Uh, the one thing with Minoy is it's so broadly distributed. Um, it's found in Ukraine, Belarus, Russia, China, Uzbekistan, Kazakhstan, Afghanistan, Egypt, Turkey, Armenia, uh, Italy. So France, in fact, they found some in France uh, in, in archaeological context from the 13th century. So uh, there are scholars in all those countries excavating and testing in their own way. So there's a huge body of knowledge um, that, that are sort of trying to pull pull together. Um, but uh, still, we, we really don't know the basics. Like, where was it made, for example? You know, there, there's a lot lot more things that, that need to be worked out. But it's a very interesting question. Um, but it, what we can tell from the differences is, is very little. Yes, there are differences. Sometimes it's pinker. And they're using a 10% ratio of clay to, to bind it together. So if you've got pure white clay, it's going to look very different from using a, a red clay, which will give a pinkish tone to the body. Um, but there's only so much that you can know from what, what does that tell us when it's in a, in a non-archaeologically provenance context. Thank you. And Melanie Gibson, what do you think about the bird on some of the bases? Could it be a workshop mark? Yeah, that's that's sort of my assumption. I, I don't know what else it would be because you you know it's not part of the decorative program. You know, you're not, not generally seeing it, um, and um, and they don't seem to be the sort of vessels that you're going to drink from. So it's sort of revealed as it's tipped up. They're pretty. You know, there the, there are minai bowls that are footless um, that have decoration on underneath. There's one in Paris and, and one in um, the Fitzwilliam, but they're they're relatively uncommon. And for the most part, the, the glaze doesn't run all the way down. They're unglazed on the inside. It, it's not particularly pretty. So that does suggest it must be something else. I, I, I think a workshop mark would be the best idea, I, or you know, maybe even an individual, but yeah, probably a, a workshop mark. Thank you very much. Um, any other questions? I think you've... Um answered lots of questions quite uh, comprehensively thank you I saw one person i think they inadvertently sent it as a direct message they're just asking about the, the oh. source of the blue color um and, and just to say that it's it's cobalt oxide which is primarily uh in terms of the uranium production uh from kamsar the mines in kamsar which is about i don't know i don't know how far 30 40 kilometers um outside kashan so it's it's a metal oxide all of the colors uh, are metal oxides Mm. In relation to that blue, I was I was quite surprised to see how many pieces have the bleeding of the blue. Uh, it's because in such you know complex and and refined objects, it's a bit surprising to see that. Um, it's just a result of loss of control in the kiln. Um, you could have something on one side of the kiln where the temperature stays in the right area. Uh, even on the inside, you can have with the updraft, the movement of heat over the outside means that the, the temperature doesn't spike, whereas if it starts to gather on the inside, so you've got air, static air versus moving air um, can mean temperature differential. So you can have the blue on the outside be fired, quote unquote, correctly, 
and overfired on the inside. And the same way you can have luster working on one surface of a bowl and completely either not adhered or, or burned off um, on, on the other surface of it. So mm -hmm. it, it is very technically challenging. So you could find that, and they put you know huge numbers of fired at once because of the cost of, of fuel. So it may well be that the vast majority were fine and these happened not to be. It might be that they all went off, um, but it is a, it is a very um, risky business you know, it, it, uh, because they didn't have a thermometer. Imagine trying to run a, run a kiln without a thermometer. You know, you've got no idea what the actual temperature. You have to look at the color of things, color of the flame, how controlled it is. I mean, they're amazing craftsmen, um, but they, they were working um, with with pretty limited tools in terms of the complexity of what they were what they were delivering. Thank you very much, Richard. I think, uh, yeah, is there everything from the audience? Do you have any private message? No, there was just that one about the uh, about the color. Yes, there is Roxana Zenhari. Thank you very much for the interesting and insightful presentation. Thanks for listening. <laughs> You've done the hard <laughs> well, thank you very much, Richard. Oh. That was really interesting. And good luck with the publication of this material. We are waiting. Uh, we are looking forward to, to, to that. So and, um, yeah, thank you very much. And, and uh, a virtual applause to you also for answering you know all the questions thank you and goodbye thank you